So I thought I would um, try to give a few kind of reflections of things that I've learned over the last 10 years. Um, and I don't think this is in any way comprehensive. You know, I I'm not trying to overthink this. I think if I were to come up with 10 lessons learned again from scratch, I would probably come up with a different set. Um, but anyway, that's what I'm going to try to do. Hopefully something will be interesting to y'all. Um, and I thought I would start with a sort of a random factoid. I don't know if anybody knows this because um, I haven't really shared it, but the original name for D3 was actually Epheme, which is a contraction of ephemeral, uh, which was a reference to how selections in D3 were transient. You know, you would select some elements, you would manipulate them, and then you would kind of throw away the selection. You didn't have to persist it. It wasn't like most other tools where you had this scene graph that you would manipulate. And so I find it funny that, you know, 10 years later, this thing that was initially named after something that was transient and ephemeral is still so central to what I do every day and is still thriving and growing uh, and evolving. Um, all right, so here are my sort of 10 random lessons that I am going to share with you. And, and the first one I think hopefully is no surprise, uh, which is the sort of awesome power of documentation and, uh, you know, specifically, examples. I, I think when I, you know, started D3, I was already in, in the view that documentation was very important, but sort of seeing how important the, the, the examples and documentation have been to D3's success has only sort of redoubled and, and re-solidified that belief. Um, I think, you know, when you're a tool builder, it's easy to kind of get sucked into the, the tool itself and thinking about kind of features and bugs and, you know, functionality. Um, and you also can really internalize so much about how this tool works that, you know, a tool can be, you know, obvious and familiar, uh, you know, self-evident to you as the tool builder. Um, but, you know, for, for anyone else, it, it can be absolutely foreign. Um, so I think, you know, if your goal as a tool builder is to create something that people will use, right, like to have a practical impact and you're, you're not just doing it because it's fun or interesting. And that's a totally valid reason too. But, you know, if, if you want to create something that you, you think people will really, will really use, you know, you have to think about documentation. You have to think about teaching as kind of a central part of your strategy. Because, you know, in that sense, a tool is only as good as people understand it, right? As, as they're able to internalize it themselves. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm a big believer in that. I think that's also helped to, you know, inform what we're doing with Observable by putting that kind of front and center. And so I hope for, for any of you that are also building tools that you sort of, you think about documentation as a central part of your strategy as well. Um, now, one thing I would also say is that in some sense, documentation and examples are almost too powerful in the sense that they can you know, kind of compensate for some of the flaws that you might have in your design or designs that are hard to use. Uh, you know, I'm looking at you, D3 stack, um, right? So people can, um, I think, develop an almost excessive reliance on the examples where they're, you know, they, they don't necessarily become fluent in the API and they sort of rely on the examples as their starting point. And, you know, clearly that's, that's a fine working strategy too. You know, you do what you got to do to be productive. But I think for me as a, as a tool builder, the other thing that I'm looking for is are people able to, you know, become fluent in the API as well? Can they internalize it? And can they sort of create things from scratch and, and original works as well and sort of not become overly dependent on the example? So those things kind of work together. Um, and there's another aspect of it as well, which is sort of how examples influence the design. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. Um, okay, so the second thing I want to mention, I think this might be a little bit controversial or maybe surprising um, coming from me, but I think people overvalue interaction and animation. Um, you know, the kind of the bells and whistles, the, uh, the whiz bang stuff um, in, in visualization. Um, I think part of the reason for this is that these tools are, you know, they're impressive and they're novel and they're exciting. And sometimes, you know, that people are, get excited about them and they want to incorporate that into their own visualizations. Um, but the other aspect of it is that they are often hard to get working. And that means it's very easy for them to be distracting, right? You get excited about this feature, like incorporating, you know, zoom into your scatter plot, and it can potentially distract you from what the real purpose of your visualization should be, which is to either sort of discover something for yourself 
or to communicate some insight to somebody else. So I worry sometimes about people kind of getting distracted by these, the technical aspects of getting these features work, working and therefore losing sight of sort of the, the purpose of visualization, um, you know, which is insight, right? Either finding it for yourself or communicating that. And, you know, please don't take this as a moral judgment. You know, I certainly like uh, make this mistake myself sometimes, you know, even more than other people probably, because I think a lot about how these features are implemented. Um, but I think it's it's still good to say because I think you should look out for it in your own work as well. You know, it's like, am I really trying to, or is this work that I'm doing really helping me communicate or is it helping me discover something, you know, or am I just kind of excited about this technical was bangery, um, you know, and I think that that's also thinking about it from a, you know, user centric design perspective, right? Thinking about what the impact of your visualization is. Um, now, I think this also ties into examples a little bit, because remember that um, examples are not always representative of real world visualizations. A lot of examples are pedagogical devices, right? They serve to teach a particular technique, either how to do it or what it's good for or what it's, what it's uh, used for. And so, you know, if you get excited about a particular technique that you see in, a, in an example, it's not necessarily, I mean, I, I hope that it is, and I would try to make it so if, if it's possible, but it's not always a great illustration of, um, you know, a good application of that technique. Sometimes it's just sort of a technical show and tell kind of thing rather than a like this is how you would actually put this into practice like sometimes that context i think is missing um, from the examples now i think if you're interested in this topic i would really recommend that you read gregor aisha's post from a few years ago which is in defense of interactive graphics um, mm -hmm. because i think that gives sort of more detail on on when interaction and animation is useful. I do think that it is useful in many different contexts and that, that it is valuable. This is merely more of a statement of how I see it put into practice and sort of how it has drawbacks associated with it as well. Um, it's not just sort of a strictly net positive that you can add to any visualization and make it better. And I think that it's also a good practice to kind of start from the static design of a visualization because it really forces you to think about what you're trying to communicate what's important, uh, you know, particularly if you're doing explanatory visualizations. If you're doing more exploratory stuff, then absolutely, like, interaction is great for you to discover what's interesting more quickly in your visualization. But for a lot of us that are also doing explanatory graphics, you know, I think keep a wary eye on, on what the value is that, that interaction and animation are providing. Okay, so related to that, number three, data preparation. Yeah, I think that's what I was, number three. Um, so I think, you know, if you're not spending time on, you know, interaction and animation and bells and whistles, right, then, then what is the work of visualization? Like, what do you spend most of the time doing? And I think perhaps uh, maybe this is disappointing to some, but I think most of it is really data manipulation, right? It's, uh, it's finding your data, it's cleaning it, it's transforming it, it's modeling it, it's, uh, you know, D3 group and D3 roll up all that sort of stuff, joining data together. Um, I think in a, some sense, like the answer to your visualization often exists in the data structure. And then the visualization is, you know, is just a more direct mapping of that data structure, meaning that most of the work of visualization is getting the data into the right structure first. It's not often just choosing the encodings or the the, the technical work of constructing that visualization. So I think I'm, you know, I think that the part of D3 that I reach for most often, I'm almost positive is D3 array, right? That's the that's the low level tools for, for doing data manipulation um, and D3 group, D3 group and D3 roll up, which are the, the sort of latest additions to that, which I'm really excited about. Um, but I'm also excited about sort of some of the complementary work that's happening in JavaScript these days, um, such as Arcaro, um, from Jeff Hare and UW IDL, um, which is built on top of, or, or at least it's compatible with Apache Arrow, um, and other sort of like tidy JS um, and other projects that are that are happening that sort of help people transform their data more quickly. Um, so related to this, I think the fourth point is, uh, you know, you often can't tell whether a visualization is going to be effective um, for you for the questions that you're trying to answer until you've put your data into it. Right. So remember, we talked about sort of some of the dangers of examples earlier. 
I think one of the dangers there is you get really excited about an example. You think, now that's going to be the one that I want. Um, in a sense, you commit to it prematurely before you've put your data into it and before you've actually able to see whether that visualization is appropriate, right? Because I think you can't really answer the question until you see your own data into it. Does, does that visualization surface the trend or the pattern um, that you were expecting or that you weren't expecting? Or is it just kind of, you know, the, the null hypothesis equivalent of a visualization and doesn't really show you anything? Um, so I think, you know, that's influenced the design of Observable as well. We want to try to make it as fast as possible for you to take one of these examples and just replace the data set uh, and see how it works. You know, you don't even need an account. You don't need to fork it. You can just hit the, the replace button on the file there. Um, but of course, that's dependent on you getting the data into the same structure. And so we want to make that part of it easier as well, because if your data doesn't happen to be in the in the same exact structure as the example, which is probably true 99% of the time, you know, it's still going to be a bunch of work for you to do that. And whatever we can do to make that easier, I think, is beneficial. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, so fifth point here, and we touched on this a little bit, but I think visualization, you know, it's not all the same, right? There's different types of visualization. And I think of it as living on this continuum from, you know, exploratory to explanatory, excuse me. Um, right? So an exploratory visualization, I think of it as something that you're making really for yourself. You want to understand what's going on in your data. You're developing some insight in your own mind versus an explanatory visualization, which is, you know, you already understand something and now you're trying to communicate that to someone else. You know, that could be your coworker, that could be your boss, that could be, you know, the, the broader world at large that is interested in, in whatever you're, you're analyzing. Um, and of course, there's a spectrum there as well, where you can have things that are in between, like you can have a visualization that is explanatory, where there's some like top level insight that you're trying to communicate, but it may also incorporate some exploratory aspects where people can kind of personalize it, right? Like they can see themselves in the data, or they can ask sort of more specific questions. Um, and there can also be, you know, exploratory, um, you know, applications that you might build within your company, right? When you when you design a dashboard, for example, you know, there can be some exploratory functions to that as well. And so that's incorporating some of your own opinions as to what's important, what you're trying to communicate, but also giving some sort of constrained ways that a reader can answer their own questions um, and sort of tweak some of aspects of it in a more limited way. Um, so I think, you know, as you're designing a visualization, think about sort of where you are on the spectrum and what you're trying to do. Uh, and in particular, if you're trying to do something that's explanatory, I think that the bar is in a sense higher because you have to be explicit about what you're trying to communicate. Um, you know, you can't, you don't just stop when the visualization looks good, right? Like when it's pretty, um, you want to actually make sure that you understand something. I found it particularly useful, you know, working for the New York Times, how important the annotation layer was and you know if you couldn't think of what to say right if you couldn't think of what annotations you wanted to add or what title you wanted to put on the chart then clearly you know it wasn't ready to publish yet because you had to be able to put to words at least a handful of insights that you were trying to communicate with that visualization it couldn't just sort of superficially appear like it it was an interesting visualization you actually had to be able to put it to words Okay, so point six, and this is a little random jumping here, but I think, um, you know, 10% of code causes 90% of bugs. <laughs> I think we, you maybe want to believe that sort of all code is equally likely to contribute bugs, or maybe there's like sort of good code and bad code, and some people are more likely to write buggy code, but that's not how it works at all. Um, I think that there's just some code that is sort of inherently more likely to have bugs in it and therefore require more support. Um, for D3, that turned out to be um, the interactive behaviors. So things like D3 zoom, uh, D3 drag, and D3 brush, I think easily those were the hardest um, to support and maintain and the most frequent sources of bugs. And if you think about it, I think it makes sense because, you know, those interaction is, is complicated. You're talking about sort of asynchronous events, um, these state machines, um, where, you know, the, the permutations of things that can happen is very large. It's not like a date formatter where it's very sort of predictable. You give this input in, you expect this output out. Um, you know, when you're talking about sort of arbitrary sequences of events, um, unexpected things can happen. And that's true even of the 
standards and technologies that those behaviors are built on top of, right? So browsers struggle with it as well. And you've seen sort of the, the standards evolve over time, right? Where we have the introduction of pointer events and we have the, you know, well, a long time ago, but the introduction of touch events, right? So we've moved from different ways of interfacing with computers. And sometimes you get those in sort of unexpected combinations, right? You have a device which supports both pointers like a mouse um, or devices like a mouse and touch events simultaneously. So what do you do? And you also have other ambiguities where it's like you're trying to click on something, but maybe you're trying to click and drag to select text, or maybe you're going to double click, or you maybe we want to brush and zoom at the same time. And all of those things make it tricky. So I think, you know, that also speaks to what we were talking about earlier of this sort of the, the challenge and the burden of implementing interaction. So as soon as you start to add that functionality to your visualization, um, it's it can be a significant burden, even when you're using tools like D3 that, that try to make it easier for you. OK, so point seven. Um, is in this kind of like the the documentation point, but I think, you know, if you're building tools for other for other people, um, support is a really powerful means of user research. And by that, I mean, you know, like when you do support, like when you answer people's questions on Stack Overflow or when you answer them on Twitter or when you answer them in the, the Google group or something like that, you know, you're not doing that in a sense, like strictly for altruistic reasons. I think as the tool builder, you get a benefit from that as well, which is that you learn what people struggle with and you learn how they think about a particular problem and I think if you can better, you know, understand how other people approach these problems, you know, you can communicate with them more effectively and you can build tools that sort of match their expectations more effectively. So there's, there's a huge benefit for you as a tool builder to really be involved with the people that are using your tools because it'll help you build a better tool. And that's just a very, I think, simple conclusion, but one that is maybe not um, embraced universally or, or could be could be sort of more widely adopted i guess uh, anyway it's one of the lessons that i've learned um the flip side of that though i think is that you also need to be careful as the tool builder that you know you can't solve everybody's problems um, it doesn't scale and i think you know sometimes there's this feeling that you know you want everybody to have a good time you want everybody to be happy you want them to all be successful using your tool and so there's a feeling that you need to sort of be there for everybody answering all of their questions. Um, and I think sometimes you just have to admit to yourself that, that you can't scale as an individual. You can't make sure that everyone has a good time. Some people are going to struggle and that's just, you know, the nature of the beast, I guess. Um, but I think at the same time, you know, you still want to be involved there and, and try to look for patterns, look for, ways that you can make your support scale so not necessarily helping each answer each individual question but you know when you see the same question being asked again and again thinking about how you can turn that into a tutorial or how you can change the design of your tool to sort of um, prevent those problems before they happen um, now related to this point number eight um, if you're sharing your work publicly the internet will make you feel bad um, this is true <laughs> This is true for me. I'm sure it's true for everyone else as well. And so I think it's no matter how good your work is in some sense, or like how successful you are, uh, the internet is a terrible place. Um, and I say that somewhat facetiously, but like, you, you know, <clears throat> it, can be, it can be a challenge. And I think I, I've also, I haven't shared this part, but I, and, and don't please, <laughs> Don't judge me again. This is how this is how I deal with it. But I, I maintain a collection of mean tweets uh, that people have shared about D3. I'm not sharing them with anyone else. Um, it's just kind of how I process it. Um, and sometimes like it, it actually does turn into a good thing. So, you know, I think one of the weird things about social media, people have always been frustrated. You know, people have a bad experience trying to use a tool or, or you know, going to a restaurant or whatever. Uh, the difference with social media is that now everybody gets to hear it, right? Including the, the creators of that tool and that sort of thing. So, you know, I, I certainly don't judge anybody for being frustrated. I know that there are flaws in my tools and weaknesses in my documentation and that I can always do better. Um, but there is also, you know, an emotional cost, if I'm being honest, of hearing everybody's frustration. You know, I think that's kind of the new thing that social media provides is that now, you know, the tool maker gets to hear every instance of people being frustrated. And it, it doesn't really get shared, you know, uniformly. Um, 
you know, because I think if you are really frustrated, you want to vent somewhere and you can just go to social media. If you're just having kind of an averagely good time, you know, you probably don't feel like it's worth tweeting about. So they're not representative of people's experience. Certainly people do tweet positive things as well, and that feels great. Um, but I think also, you know, as a human, those bad experiences tend to have a disproportionate impact on you as well. Like those are the things that you remember. Like I can remember the bad tweets more than I can remember the good ones. And, and I wish I could remember the good ones. I mean, I remember some of the good ones as well, but you know, that's just, that's just the way it is. And I think no matter how thick of a skin you have, that's the effect. So, you know, I would ask, you know, if you do get frustrated with a tool or with, with not, not with D3, but with anything that you see out there, you know, try to think about what the practical impact is of your words. Um, you know, if you need to ask for help, absolutely ask for help, you know, and if something is, you know, uh, you know, reprehensible, absolutely <laughs> go ahead and, and, and call that out. But I think, you know, if, if it's just going to contribute to burnout and frustration and, and you're just kind of discouraging somebody from working on their tool, then, you know, maybe think twice about that. Maybe share that with your friends, you know, or maybe think about how you can contribute to the project rather than just complaining about it. Because I think, you know, that the problem of burnout in open source is real and, um, I, I absolutely want, uh, you know, open source to continue to be successful and D3 to continue to be successful. And I think you have to look at sort of what people get out of it. And a lot of what I get out of it is this feeling that I'm helping other people, you know, be productive, to understand their data, um, to, you know, have a positive impact in the world. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it dilutes that sometimes when I just, I hear the negativity and, and the frustration as well. Um, okay. So, you know, if, if the internet is bad, I think the flip side of that is like that the number nine point is don't go it alone, right? There is value in a community, but I think it's, it's better to have sort of a stable community, sort of a closer community than just sort of the, the internet at large. Um, and so I think it's really important, um, you know, particularly if you're just starting out um, and if you want to get better is to try to find a team, you know, a community that you can work together with and um, that can provide some external validation, that can provide feedback, you know, mentoring, um, just creative ideas, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, and again, that's part of what we're trying to do with Observable is to, to bring this community of practitioners together um, so that they can share techniques, um, they can learn from each other, um, and they can sort of form kind of a tighter bond than just the, the broader internet at, at large, I guess. Um, now, okay, the last point, you know, I think I've talked for probably a lot more than 10 minutes now. <laughs> um, I was originally going to say, you know, take it easy. Um, but I think that's kind of a little bit disingenuous coming from me because I'm probably the last person to take it easy. Um, you know, I wish I could take it easy. So in some ways, this is like, you know, advice that I want to give to myself that I don't necessarily listen to. Um, but maybe I would say it as like, try to have a good time. Um, and I feel a little bit like a life coach now, you know, or like a celebrity giving you advice <laughs> like that. You don't really, you, you don't need this advice for me. Anyway, I'm just sharing it. This is what, this is something that I think about. And obviously you don't have to listen to it, but um, <clears throat> I think if you understand sort of what parts of your work and your life that you enjoy, you know, and you spend more time doing that, you know, it's a good idea. You're more likely to be successful. Um, I think it's, it's still very important or it can be very useful and valuable to have, you know, some ambitious goals to give you some structure and something to strive for. But I think you have to make sure that you enjoy the journey, right? That you, that you live in the moment um, and that you like sort of your day-to-day -day experience uh, as well. Um, and I, that sounds, I don't know if that sounds easy. Maybe it sounds trite, but it, um, I think it is hard to do in practice. It's really easy to kind of get sucked into what, whatever your long-term objectives are and forget that you're not actually enjoying the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, but I think if you are able to do that, you know, it's a good idea. Um, I think for one thing, you know, you'll have fewer regrets if you do fail because you, you know, you had a good time along the way and you got something out of it. It wasn't just that you were solely focused on the outcome of this goal, that you actually, you know, lived each day and you enjoyed it. Um, but paradoxically, I think you can also be more likely to succeed because one of the natures, uh, or one of the aspects of having these long-term goals um, is that, you know, they're hard and there'll be times where you struggle and you want to give up. 
Um, and I think if you enjoy the day to day, you're more likely to succeed because you can persevere, right? You're willing to overcome those bumps in the road because you're not just focused on that, that goal at the end. You, you actually enjoy being in the moment and you're able to sort of keep trucking. Um, so for me, you know, as I've said, I really love, you know, this feeling of making tools that people love to use and seeing the impact of that on the world. Um, but I also, you know, kind of selfishly love building tools, right? Like just for their own sake and developing abstractions and solving puzzles um, and that sort of thing. So I think if you're, you know, disappointed that I'm not out there giving more to giving more talks and that sort of thing, I hope that um, <laughs> hopefully it's because I'm heads down, you know, building something new and that sort of thing. So thank you all for listening to my rambling talk. Uh, and I'm very excited to see, to just be here and, and to celebrate D3. Thank you. Thank you.